to lead us right into the presence of God. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this night where we can take the time to remember your sacrifice on the cross, Lord God. I pray that as we worship, as we take communion, as we listen to the word that Pastor Dan has, that you would open our hearts and open your ears to your word and what you have to say to us. In your name I pray. Amen. Praise God. He is good. Amen. come to remember the crucifixion and yet to celebrate the freedom that it's provided to us. 
The elements for communion are going to be distributed in just a few moments. And as we continue to worship our God and our King, I'm going to ask you to hold those elements so that we can partake together at the end of the song. So would you be kind enough to bow your head and pray with me as we enter into this time? Oh, Lord, thank you for this day, this glorious dark day. Thank you for what it means in three days. Lord, I ask that you would help each one of us to examine our hearts tonight, that we would be in right relationship with you and with each other, Lord. We reflect tonight on your death and your shed blood and on the sacrifice of love. We worship you, Lord, for you are worthy. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, Lord. Lead us to that cross, Lord. Hallelujah. Savior, I come. Quiet my soul. Where your love 
on this night, we reflect on our roots, deep ones that extend through the birth of the Pentecostal church a hundred years ago from the Holy Movement. And from the Reformation, the beginning of the Protestant church, down through the Dark Ages and the Crusades, through the Emperor Constantine when he founded a formal church, through the spread of the gospel in Rome, in Samaria, in Judea, and Jerusalem. And to the night before our Lord shared the Passover meal with his disciples, he took the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this is the cup of the new covenant. This is my blood and do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. When you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim that the Lord's death, he will be coming soon. So tonight, this is representative of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, what was given for us. Let us eat together. Symbolic of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which we have the forgiveness of sin. Let us drink together. Father God, we come in humility and thanksgiving for your saving grace through the sacrifice of your Son, our Lord. Bless us and be with us tonight as we reflect on the cross, the death, the burial, and then the resurrection of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. 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 God is good. Amen. 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 You may have a seat. It's so good to see your faces this evening. Every time I greet somebody, I'm like, good morning. Good morning. It's evening. I feel you, Pastor Amanda. It's evening. Good evening. I just wanted to real quickly just um, something that God just impressed on my heart is um, the man who hung next to Jesus on the cross that day. And the one um, who said, do you not look at Jesus and can you not at least respect him? We deserve to die. and He's been perfect. And he said, Jesus, please remember me. And Jesus said, today I will remember you. You will be with me in paradise. In that moment, that man just said, Jesus, remember me. And in that moment, in that one moment, God said, Jesus said, you will be with me in paradise. And I just think it's so amazing. His love and his grace in his most in his moment of most agony and most pain he is still saying i love you this is for you i can't imagine as much as i love my children when i'm hurting and i'm i'm just sick and i just don't feel good i'm like could you just leave my room please <laughs> just let me be miserable by myself and here jesus said oh, i love you so much and in my pain and in my agony this is for you and today you will be with me church it is that easy it is that easy if there's anyone in here who does not have a personal relationship with Jesus please know that today you can be with him and you can be his it is that easy amen amen we're gonna um go ahead and uh have an awesome message from my awesome husband is that okay is that okay yeah okay good thank you church I think she wants a raise Amen. Thank you for being with us tonight. If you're visiting with us, uh, what a pleasure and an honor to host you on this uh, Good Friday uh, evening. As Pastor Donna said, it's hard to see the word good in this, but we know ultimately that because of Christ's sacrifice, it became good. Amen. Uh, and I'm so thankful for a, 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 can I say it this way? I'm so thankful for a God who loves us so much that he bore the pain 
and suffering that I so rightly deserve. And so tonight we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, it's hard for me not to be smiley and happy uh, because I read the end of the book. <laughs> and uh, so I know what's coming, right? And so uh, uh, I got all kinds of jokes, but I, I don't know if we're ready for those tonight as, as far as uh, too many Christians sometimes stay in Good Friday. Aren't you glad the tomb's empty? Because on Good Friday, the tomb was filled. And so the power hadn't been released. I'm not supposed to preach yet. So if you're with us, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, hey, we've got these cards out on the Welcome Center. Uh, they're probably up and down the, the, uh, the foyer. You could probably find them in different places, but I know they're at the Welcome Center. Uh, on the front, it says, Jesus is dead. Guess what Sunday is? No, it's Easter. Ah, good night. No, I'm just kidding. You were losing either way, coach. If you would have said Easter, I would have said April Fool's Day. So, I mean, you you were lost. Uh, so, hey, we've got a bunch of these invite cards. Uh, that, not a bunch. We have a couple that are still out there. I want to encourage you uh, to uh, find somebody over the course of tonight if you go out to eat or tomorrow in your travels between here, here and there. How do you know that the day before Easter and the day before Christmas are the busiest traffic days of the year because everybody's running i was at target today and i was like good it's like the apocalypse happened and i asked the lady behind the counter i said is it always this way and she goes sir you haven't seen tomorrow yet and i go what do you mean she goes we'll run out of peanut butter eggs you know what i'm talking about right come on somebody just got saved right there didn't they how many of you like them in the freezer okay how many of you just like them right out of the bag how many of you just like them? <laughs> All right. So, hey, find somebody uh, and give them a card. Invite them to services on Sunday, uh, 830 and 1030. Our cafe is going to open about 945, and we're so, so very excited about what God is going to do. This evening, I want to start off uh, with a little bit of a video clip. It's about nine minutes long, and I promise you, you won't lose uh, you won't lose interest. But this is the, uh, basically, this is Good Friday told uh, in a nine-minute segment taken right out of Scripture, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you're going to enjoy this, but this is going to set us up for the rest of the evening. So tonight, I want to present to you Good Friday. It was a different.
No, it is the very power of God. Now, I want you to think in context, and the Holy Spirit was just working on me as I was watching the video, which I've seen multiple times. I was thinking about the fact that the Holy Spirit was up in heaven at the moments that Jesus is uh, being beaten and, the, and getting put on the cross. Uh, the Holy Spirit was hanging out in heaven, uh, much like a racehorse or a race racing dog would be in the cage. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, maybe you've never been, maybe you've seen it on a television show or a movie, uh, definitely not advocating that we're all gamblers, but uh, uh, y- you know that when the race begin, right before the race begins, those those animals, their 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 chests are beaten up against the metal door, right? And you can see the door kind of buckle a little bit because the horse or the dog knows what's coming. And I think the Holy Spirit was much like that racehorse uh, in the boundaries of heaven. Uh, his chest was bowing up against the boundaries of heaven. And he was just waiting to see Jesus die. Because Jesus said this. Jesus said, uh, the comforter cannot come until I leave you. But when I leave you, I'm sending something greater for you. And then you'll be able to do even greater things than I did. And so uh, I, we wear black and we get all kind of somber on Good Friday. Yet the Holy Spirit was saying, hurry up and die so we can get this party started. Now, before you poke fun at me and before you say, hey, Pastor Dan, that's language I'm not necessarily used to, I'm saying, church, it was in the script. It was in the script. Up until the last 10 years ago, the final episode of MASH, Goodbye and Farewell, remember that episode? The final episode of MASH, uh, Goodbye and Farewell, was the most watched television episode ever. In history, then the movie, the show Twenty Four came along. The Walking Dead, other other shows began to really kind of knock at those records. But if you remember the, I think it was twelve seasons that Mash ran. If you remember, any time they would lose a character, what would happen to us Mash fans? We'd cry. How how can how can uh, uh, Colonel Blake uh, have his plane be shot down over the uh, the South China Sea? Remember that episode? You know how how can they take radar off the show? Remember that? Uh, some of you Trapper John fans, how how can you remove him and, and put this straight laced guy from San Francisco on the show? Uh, I, I'm tugging at your uh, cultural feelers this evening because I want you to realize that God knows the script better than we do. And nothing that we live from this year, April 2nd, all the way to December 24th, nothing that we live in those eight and a half months means anything unless Jesus died. It means nothing unless he died. It's foolishness to those that aren't being saved. It's foolish. Somebody came into my, uh, talked to me today and they said, hey, Pastor Dan, I was persecuted for Christ's sake. Do you want to know what my antennas did? Bing, I want to hear the story. (laughs) Think of when you were persecuted for being a Christian. It was because that other person did not understand. and They were jealous and on the inside they were saying, I want to understand where you get this peace that passes all understanding. I heard a preacher this week say, Christians are either storm doors or trap doors. Of course, I went, ding, I got to hear this one. And he said, "Most all Christians are storm doors because of all the storms that they've gone through. The problem is the trap door Christian gets caught and ends up falling down and never gets up because he focuses or she focuses on the storm instead of the creator of the storm. The message of the cross is foolishness. Mark chapter 10, Jesus is speaking, and they, uh, he's speaking, I think we would call this third person, and they will mock him, and they will spit on him, and they will flog him, and they will kill him, and after that three days he will rise again. <laughs> I can't preach Good Friday because I know what's coming. I've read the end of the book, church. I've read the end. 
And I know what's coming. Romans chapter 5, the apostle Paul uh, had it penned this way. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die while we were still sinners. I entitled this night, this, this evening's message, The Night That Love Died. And as I wrote it, I originally said, the night love died. And then that didn't really ring a bell. It's the night that the enemy thought he was going to cancel out the greatest love ever known for mankind. And he had no earthly idea what was really happening. The enemy had no clue. The enemy had no clue how he was playing into the script that God wrote. He had no idea. You see, Friday's not just good, church. <laughs> it's life-changing. It's life-changing. Because we realize that Jesus became our sacrifice. He became our sacrifice. Come on, husband. I, I know you're like me, and, and uh, you're down to the last ice cream sandwich in the freezer. And it's 9.30 at night, and everybody's asleep. And instead of taking the last ice cream sandwich in the freezer, you say, nope, I'm going to let my wife enjoy that. Right, husband? Some of your wives are selling you out. <laughs> but you see, Jesus said, I'm not just going to leave the last ice cream sandwich. I'm going to give them a whole truck full. Because he became our sacrifice. And then he said, greater love than no man than that he would lay down his life. You see, Jesus put a price tag on the night that love died. He put a big price tag on it because he knew the script, church. You see, on this day some 2,000 years ago, there was this intimate supper that, that we in our uh, liturgical mindsets in churches all across the world try to replicate and we do it with just a little uh, crouton of bread and a, uh, a little thimble of juice or, or depending on the church, maybe wine. We try to replicate this thing. And the bottom line, church, is it was nothing like what was happened on that night. Because Jesus knew he, he, was, he was not yet sweating tears of blood, but he was sweating tears of sweat. Because the part king was also part human. And he, there's no way he could sit there and know that what he was about to face was just an ordinary night. And we try to replicate it in our liturgicalness, if that's even a word. Uh, and, and we try to go there. Church, I'm here to tell you that the communion of Jesus dying is irreplaceable. It's irreproducible. It is nothing that you and I will ever truly understand. Because we've never had to give it all. Have you? Have you had to give it all? That night in this intimate dinner that was taking place amongst friends. John 13 records it this way. Jesus uh, came to Simon Peter and he said, <laughs> Peter said to him, Lord, you're going to wash my feet? Now we chuckle at the skit guys and their, uh, their New Yorky or Philadelphian accents. But Peter, in the midst of what Jesus was walking through, ask the most sarcastic question possible. Jesus, you're going to go to the smelliest part of my body, the dirtiest part of who I am, and you're going to take care of that? Little did Peter knew, know what was about to happen. That he not only was going to go to the dirtiest part of Peter, but he was going to go down to the grave, to the depths of hell. And he was going to take care of business. And, and Peter, in his uh, goofiness, <laughs> Peter then said, all right, Lord, don't just wash my feet, wash all of me. I find it very interesting that Peter end up dying the death of Jesus, but at his final request asked that he would be crucified upside down because he said, I'm not worthy to die the same way as the Messiah. You see, Jesus washed all of Peter. That's what this night represents. You know, we, as Christians, we live in Good Friday probably more than we do Easter Sunday. And here's how I know is because we get all worked up on Easter Sunday like no other day of the year. And then on April 8th, I'm curious if we'll have as many people in church on April 8th as we do on April 1st. 
And then I'm interested in to know the number of Christians that are back in church on April 8th. Well, they say they have the same ferocious appetite for the things of God that they did on April 1st. You see, because we live in rote too much. It becomes foolishness to those of us who have even been saved. Because we don't really understand what it is to pay it all. Did you know that about 12 hours ago, in different places in the Middle East, last year, this year, last year, the year before, year before that, and on down the line, that there were Christians that were put on a cross in mocking of Christianity? Do you know that? Christians that literally paid it all. They knew the price and they were willing because this night was so very important to them, but they didn't stay here. They couldn't get up on that cross unless they knew Sunday is coming. Because Sunday's coming. This morning, this evening, I did it too, Pastor Amanda. In Ephesians chapter 2, the slides will be there for you to read along with me. Once you were, the Apostle Paul's writing to the church of Ephesus, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Aren't you glad that it, the word says once? <laughs> so we as Christians, though, we think we've got to go back to the cross and recommit our lives to him, right? Aren't you glad that Jesus doesn't have to die every time we feel like we've got to go repent of our sins? He said, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin. I should stop preaching there because I know there's sin in the house. Because I know what goes through my head. Remember I was at Target today? People got to drive cars to get to Target. Think of what you guys call each other in the roads of Massachusetts. Okay? All right? Yeah, it's tough to be a Christian sometimes on Highway 2. Highway 140. Have you ever done 140 in rush hour? I wish I spoke in tongues more because I need to on 140. <laughs> you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world. Boy, that'll preach, won't it, when you're in traffic? Watching all the sinners go by? I won't preach that today. Obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. I was standing with some coaches last night. And a coach comes up and they're talking and they start talking about playing basketball. And this group of coaches obviously knows what I do for a living. And I, I couldn't tell if he said it on purpose or if he forgot. But he goes, yeah, I love playing basketball on Sunday mornings. So you know me. This is what I said. So do I. You guys play 6 o'clock because I'll join you. He looked at me and he said, what? I'd love to play basketball at 6 o'clock in the morning on Sunday. Come in all energized and pumped up for the day, smelling like a gym. Raise my arms. The church empties or lays out. Church, I want to be where the people that don't know Jesus are because the goal is for us not to get in our huddle, holy huddle on Good Friday. The goal is to get those that don't know this power to the foot of the cross. That's the goal. That's the goal. Preacher comes in, especially in his first year, and he says, hey, let's not do a Good Friday service. Let's go stand out on Main Street, or let's go to the bars where people are drinking, or let's show up in another world. And church people get all nervous like the pastor's drinking. No, no, no. I want to tell people about this night because you and I don't need this night. They're the ones that need this night. And if you disagree with me, let me read verse 3 again. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everybody else. I'm, I'm sitting there, like literally, I, I, I think I've only sinned three times today. One of those was in traffic, okay? Two of those were in traffic. <laughs> and then another, I, I thought kind of a selfish thought went kind of across my mind. 
okay? And I, and I kind of sat there for a little bit. You know what I'm talking about. And you kind of start to focus on you. Come on. Don't act like you're perfect, all right? So I'm sitting down in my little spot during worship, and I'm beginning to say, God, why? I feel like I'm far tonight. And he brought back to my mind those three times today that I can remember where I put my flesh out there before him. See, I went back to the selfish inclination. Did you know that it's not even the deed of sin? It's the inclination, the inclining to sin that causes us to deserve God's anger. I don't know about you, but I'm sunk. Are you sunk? There's like no hope for me, right? Don't be perfect because there's no hope for you either. So without tonight, there would be no hope. But as soon as he breathed his life, his last breath, the gates flung wide open and this horse of the Holy Spirit began to not gallop. He began to sprint all over the surface of the, of the earth and he began to set people free in ways they had never been set free before. He began to set them free from their inclinations of sin. Verse 4, but God is so rich in mercy. <laughs> As a Pentecostal, we should be all over that. <laughs> I don't care if you're a Pentecostal that speaks in tongues or you're a Pentecostal that doesn't. As people that honor the Holy Spirit and believe that the Holy Spirit has a place, it was God's mercy that he released the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the advocate, and Jesus had to die for that guy to come on this earth to set us into a place where we could be witnesses to the rest of the world. Verse 4, but God was so rich in mercy that he loved us so much. Verse 5, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ for the dead. Don't clap, wait for Sunday because we need all the clapping we can get on Sunday. It was only by God's grace that you have been saved. And church, this is how I know that grace is real because this sinner can stand before you on this Friday night and he can proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ not just as some fun thing to do but with power and authority because of what Jesus did on the cross and how the Holy Spirit was released because I'm forgiven and I'm new and I'm not the way I was. Somebody say amen. Verse 6, for he raised, I don't think you're ready for this. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ. You see, many of you look at each other, you look at yourself, well, you look at each other, but we'll preach on that next week, okay? Uh, many of you look at yourselves in the mirror and you don't see your Christ likeness. You see a woman bound in adultery because she's trying to find her identity in man. You see a man bound in his work because the identity is not in Christ. You see a former addict trying to shake the bonds of addiction. You see a person that lies and cheats and steals just to keep their neck above water. That's not what God sees. <laughs> he says right here in his word, he raised us from the dead along with Christ. Are you ready for this, church? And he seated us with him in heavenly realms because we are united in Christ. Church, I got to tell you, I'm the heaviest weight I've ever been in my life. I'm double the man I used to be. I got a wedding ring on that I've had on my finger now. Jen bought this for us, I think it was our 15-year anniversary, 10-year anniversary, somewhere long ago. I can't get this thing off without going, Andy, I'm embarrassed. I got to go into the bathroom, and I got to put a little bit of water in there, kind of, you know, and it's my own fault because I like ice cream sandwiches at 9.30 at night. I'm not blaming Jen, I'm blaming me. But one of the things I like about being fat and not being able to get this ring off is there's no doubt in anybody's mind that I'm united with Jen Lewiston. Church, take the mental picture. You are united with Christ. Is your life in such a way that when people look at you, there is no doubt you are united with Christ. 
I don't know about you, but I want to walk into the room. Uh, Pastor Jay and the team sings that song. When you walk into the, when he walks into the room, everything changes. Do you want that for your life? Because that's what I want my for li- my life. I'm so Twitter pated. I can't even talk tonight. Here's the deal. I want to be so united with Christ that there's no doubt. Listen to verse seven. It says this. So God can point us to, excuse me, so God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us and shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. How are your grandkids going to look at your church? I'm so tired of hearing grandmas and grandpas and moms and dad come with tears in their eyes because their kids and their grandkids are not following Jesus. My heart breaks for that. Pastor Jay came into my office this past week and he said, Hey, PD, I just want you to know that if everybody that used to go to Cornerstone still went to Cornerstone, we'd have a church well over 1,500 people. And so when he left the room, I shut the door and I got down on my knees and my couch and I just said, Lord, would you break the bondage of sin in the grandparents and, and, and parents as kids and grandkids, the sin that just eats at the young people of our area? Because I want to see a generation that can be pointed to for all generations that love Jesus. Sam, I don't know about you, but I know you're not raising that little one, you and Derek to just have her fall away from Jesus. I, 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 don't want, I don't want Sam to come up in 25 years with tears in her eyes and say, Pastor, what happened to my little girl? See, I got two, one, two kids under the age of 10. I don't want that to happen. But church, there's got to be something about you and me and the way we live our life so that our kids and our grandkids know that we know that we know that they know that they know that they know that that we are united with Christ. And church, I got news for you. That means we don't always have to be right as parents and grandparents. That means we got to learn to love and cherish and put our arms around and hold on to. I haven't even started preaching, so I'm just going to have to go to the end of my notes because I know some of you have dinner plans. God saved you, verse 8, by his grace when you believed. And you can take credit for this. You cannot take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Pastor Don, it's not a free gift. It's a gift. It's a gift. Aren't you glad you don't have to qualify at Christmas time? Is this gift free? You just know when it says to Dan from Santa, it's coming. It's mine. I own it. It's whatever's inside of it, if I like it or not, it's mine. Your salvation's a gift, and you don't have to do anything to earn it. Christ just gave it to you. Verse 10, he says this, for we are God's masterpiece. Church, I'm so tired of the church looking at the church and saying that we're worthless. One pastor said last week, he said, if God's called you to own a business, go down to the office and get your license and set it up because now's the time. And I was wrestling with this pastor as he was preaching this. And I was saying, Lord, that's awfully Pentecostally emotional. You've heard those sermons, haven't you? And then I come to the church on a whim today, hanging out with uh, John Russell and then Pastor Jay, and we're talking, and, and Jay brings out his little red book. I start sweating. And he read this to me. That the, that the Lord is wanting to shake up and that now is the time because the enemy's trying to close this down, but God's trying to shake up and shift us out because now should be the most powerful time that we're ever living. So church, I don't know about you, but I, 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 I want to be God's masterpiece. He, he didn't sit in art class as a kindergartner and just throw some paint on some pictures and say, that's a masterpiece. He looked at you and he formed you the way he formed you. And then he breathed life into you. And then he created you for such a time as this. But if we can't get past Friday to Sunday, God's masterpiece never, never, ever really does the work that it's supposed to. Now, I'm serious, Charlie. I had another page of notes that I got to cut out because you got me all Twitter-pated and preaching. So I'm just going to shift all the way down. John chapter 10, verse 18 says this. Jesus is speaking. He said, no one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. 
for I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also to take it up again. For that is what my Father has commanded. Church, I want to introduce to you one word. We're going to play a four-minute video that you're going, to, you're going to love. We're going to close in a song and a prayer. I want to introduce to you a word that gets beat up a lot. And it's called grace. And grace is that Jesus said, I give my life voluntarily for you. Not so I could preach a message tonight. Not so we could come back on Sunday and preach, hey, Sunday's finally here. But he loves you so much. And Ephesians said it, Romans chapter 5, I said it earlier. 1 Corinthians said it's his grace, church, for you. And so the thing I want to leave with you from my lips to yours tonight is this. Walk in God's grace for your life. Because what you see in the mirror is not what he sees in the mirror. Grace is God's Grace is God's unmerited favor for us, his crazy love. And the truth is, many times we struggle understanding it. If you find yourself struggling